Hello, welcome to the global classroom of Maulana Azad National Urdu University. This is your host, Muhammad Aslam. In today's lecture, we will study Tony Morrison's novel, The Bluest Eye. This episode is meant for MA English students. By the end of this lesson, you will learn life and works of Toni Morrison, a brief summary of the novel, background and genesis of the novel, narratological analysis of the text, thematic analysis of the text. And of course, you are advised to read the novel at least once before you listen to this lecture. Toni Morrison is an American novelist, essayist, editor, teacher, and professor emeritus at Princeton University. Let's look at the chronology of her life briefly for a short while. In 1931, February 18, she was born in Lorraine, Ohio, to her father, George Warford, and her mother, Rama Willis. In 1953, she completed her BA from Harvard University in Washington, DC. In 1955, Morrison completed MA from Cornell University. From 1955 to 57, she worked as an instructor in English at Texas Southern University, Houston. From 1957 to 64, she worked as an instructor in English at Harvard University. In 1958, Morrison marries a Jamaican architect, Harold Morrison. 1964, Harold divorced her by then, she had two sons, Harold Ford and Slade Kevin. In 1965, she became a senior editor of Random House in the New York City. In 1970, Morrison drew The Bluest Eye. 1971, she became associate professor of English in a state university of New York. 1973, she wrote the novel Sula. 1974, she edited an anthology titled The Black Book. In 1975, her novel Sula was nominated for National Book Award and received Ohian Book Award. From 1976 to 77, she worked as a visiting lecturer at Yale University. In 1977, Morrison wrote Song of Solomon and received National Book Critique Circle Award and the American Academy and Institute of Arts and Letters Award for the Song of Solomon. In 1980, she became a member of National Council on the Arts. 1981, she wrote Tar Baby. In the same year, she was elected member of American Academy and Institute of Arts and Letters. 1984, she was appointed as a professor of humanities at State University of New York at Albany. In 1986, she wrote the play Dreaming Emmett and received the New York State Governor's Art Award. From 1986 to 88, she worked as a visiting lecturer at Bard College. In 1987, she wrote Beloved. In the same year, she became Regents Lecturer at the University of California in Berkeley. In 1988, she won a series of awards. The Pulitzer Prize for Fiction, Robert F. Kennedy Award for Beloved, Melcher Award, the Columbus Foundation Award, and Elizabeth Canty Stanton Award from National Organization of Women. In 1989, she won the Modern Language Association of America's Commonwealth Award in Literature. In 1992, she brought out many works such as Jazz, Playing in the Dark, a book of literary criticism titled Whiteness and Literary Imagination. In 1993, she got Nobel Prize for Literature and delivered the Nobel Lecture. 1994, her novel lecture was published. In 1998, she wrote Paradise. In 2000, won National Humanities Award. In 2003, wrote the novel Love. In 2008, A Mercy, another novel was published. In 2012, the novel Home was published and also won Presidential Award of Freedom. In 2015, Morrison wrote God help the child. 
From this brief life chronology, you might have already understood that Morrison's life was very hectic and active in socio-political reformation. Morrison, in fact, had inherited a legacy of resistance to oppression and exploitation from her own family. Her mother had sent a letter of protest to Franklin D. Roosevelt against being given insect-infested flour when her family received public assistance. Morrison often proudly remembers this incident in her talks. She had worked on the theme of alienation in the works of William Faulkner and Virginia Woolf for her MA dissertation. This shows her quest for social change even at an early age. Through her writing, she worked hard to streamline the black experiences to the American history, which hardly represented black lives. Her novel could be seen as part of a process of recovering the past. This process involves not only recovering, but also reconstructing and revisioning the past with the help of her creative imagination. She always believed that the art is political. It's not a closed exercise of her own imagination, nor a fulfillment of personal dreams. The art must effect change and improvement and take cataract off people's eyes in an accessible way, art is to enlighten and to strengthen. She herself explains her motivation in casting maximum number of black women characters in her novel. She says, there were no books about me. I didn't exist in all the literature. In other words, she aims at filling the absence of black women characters in American fiction. In addition, through most of her writings, she wanted to address only black American audience. She was hardly interested in being a universal storyteller. Her writing is very simple, lucid, reflective of oral quality. Therefore, she is able to maintain a close relationship with her targeted readers. Morrison always believed in a participatory reading. The story happens at the end of Great Depression in the United States. Nine-year-old Claudia and 10-year-old Frida Mactia lives in Lorraine, Ohio, with their parents. Though Mactia family is poor, there is an undercurrent of love and stability in their home. The Mactia's family takes a young girl named Pecola into their house. Pecola was taken to the house because Pecola's father had tried to burn down their house and Claudia and Frida felt sorry for her. Pecola believed that whiteness is beautiful and that she was ugly because she was not white. After some time, Pecola moves back with her family and her life becomes very difficult. Her father drinks, her mother is distant and the two of them often fight one another. Her brother, Sammy, frequently runs away. Pecola believes that if she had blue eyes, she would be loved by people and her life would be different. At different stages of her life, she continually receives the confirmation of her own sense of ugliness. A grocer looks right through her when she buys a candy. At school, boys make fun of her and a light-skinned girl, Maureen, who temporarily befriends her, makes fun of her too. Further, she is wrongly blamed for killing a boy's cat and is called a nasty black bitch by her own mother. Even Pecola's parents have both had difficult lives in the past. Her mother also believes that she is ugly and the romantic love is reserved for the beautiful. Her mother, Pauline, had a lame foot and has always felt isolated and loses herself in movies. She encourages her husband's violent behavior in order to reinforce her own role as a martyr. She feels most alive when she's at work, cleaning a white woman's house. She loves this home and despises her own. Charlie, Pecola's father, was abandoned by his parents and raised by his great aunt who died when he was a young teenager. He was humiliated by two white men who found him having sex for the first time 
and made him continue while they watched. He ran away to find his father, but he was rebuffed by him. By the time he met Pauline, he had become a wild and ruthless man. He feels trapped in his marriage and has lost interest in life. Charlie returns home one day and finds Pecola washing dishes. With mixed motive of tenderness and hatred that are fueled by guilt, Charlie rapes his own daughter, Pecola. When Pecola's mother finds her unconscious on the floor, she disbelieves Pecola's story and beats her. Pecola goes to soap her church, a sham mystic, and asks him for blue eyes. Instead of helping her, he uses her to kill a dog that he dislikes. Cloudy and Frida finds out that Pecola has been impregnated by her father. Unlike the rest of her neighborhood, they wanted her baby to live. They sacrificed the money that they have been saving for a bicycle and plant marigold seeds. They believed that if flowers live, so will Pecola's baby. The flowers refuse to bloom and Pecola's baby dies when it is born prematurely. Choli, who rapes Pecola for a second time, runs away and dies in a workhouse. Pecola goes mad, believing that her cherished wish for the bluest eyes had been fulfilled. Before we start with the analysis of the novel, let's look at how the idea of blue as tie originated. It's often argued that there are some autobiographical elements in the test. In her afterword to Penguin edition of the novel, Morrison recounts an incident that led her to a short story and then to a novel. One day, a girl in her school expressed a wish for the blue eyes. The anger Morrison felt angry at this. Morrison says, the sorrow in her voice seemed to call for sympathy and I faked it for her. But astonished by the desecration she proposed, I got mad at her instead. Tony Morrison recalled this incident some 20 years later in 1960s, when the black leaders were shouting the slogans, black is beautiful, in an assertion of their racial pride. The result was a short story which she wrote in 1962 for a writer's workshop that she attended while teaching at Harvard University. The story elicited a favorable response from some members of the group and she took it up again for the revision in 1964 after her divorce. The novel was only three-fourths complete when she sent it to an editor who liked it. Thereupon, the novel was completed and published in 1970. However, Morrison insists that her works are not autobiographical. But there are some parallels between some details in The Bluest Eye and her own life experiences. For example, the story is set in the town of Lorraine, Ohio when she had grown up. Mac to your girls, Claudia and Frida are roughly of the same age that the younger Toni Morrison and her elder sister would have been in 1941 when the novel is set. Like Morrison's mother, Mr. McTeer likes singing. Like her father, Mr. McTeer throws a man down the stairs and a tricycle after him when he suspects him of molesting his daughters. Pauline Williams' family shift from Alabama to Kentucky and then to Lorraine in Ohio. Similarly, in the story, Choli moves from Georgia to Lorraine in Ohio. These are some of the autobiographical hints from the novel. Now, what does the title signify? Why is the title The Bluest Eye, which has been constructed in the superlative form? This is obviously a reference to American myth of success and a sense of competition according to which one needs to be always ahead of your neighbors and those people you know. The title shows that the blacks have absorbed their sense of competitiveness as well as the white standards of beauty symbolized by blue eyes. This is why Pecola is not satisfied 
when she thinks soap head church had given her blue eyes. She wants them the bluest of all. Morrison has written the novel with a unique narrative structure. The whole novel has been divided into four sections. These sections have been named after four seasons, autumn, winter, spring and summer. Each section consists of primarily two narrators. One, a first person account by Claudia recalling her childhood association with Pecola breed love. Two, an account by an omniscient narrator of an aspect of life of the breed love family consisting of one or more chapters. Chapters are unnumbered. She uses appropriate snippets from the rent together versions of school prema caught it in the beginning of the novel as a section breaker. The autumn begins with Claudia recalling her own family and Pecola's brief stay in their house in the first chapter. It should be noted here, as I said earlier, that the chapters are unnumbered. In the next two chapters, the narration continues as omniscient narrator describes the poor house of the breed love and loveless life of the family which is full of violence. In first chapter of the winter, Claudia recalls how Pecola was tormented by black boys and how she was rescued by Claudia and her friends. Claudia, towards the end of the narration, also narrates how she and her sister find their lodger Henry entertaining two women into their house. In second chapter of winter, omniscient narrator tells the story of immigrant blacks like Geraldine. Omniscient narrator also narrates how Pecola was tormented by her own father. The spring opens as Claudia recalls the rumor Henry's molestation of Freda and how she and her sister Freda visit the Fisher house where Pecola's mother is a servant in search of Pecola. Claudia's narration is followed by omniscient narrator who tells three major stories. One, the story of Pecola's mother Pauline and of the death of her dream. Two, the story of Pecola's father and of her rape by him. Three, the story of spiritualist fraud Sophead Church who deludes Pecola by giving false offer of the blue eye that she was seeking. In the first chapter of the summer, Claudia recalls the story of Pecola's rape by her father and of Claudia and her sister's vain attempt to make her baby live. In the final chapter, there is a break in the pattern of narration. It is a conversation between Pecola and a friend who is probably a part of herself. Finally, Claudia sums up Pecola's sad story and her acceptance of her share of blame for making the unfortunate girl a pariah and a scapegoat. Have you ever wondered about the narrative technique that Morrison employed in the text? Morrison uses a slightly but creatively modified version of traditional frame of sequential narrative. She expresses African-American characters, their desire not only to survive, but also to thrive in the face of white domination. She puts women at the center of characterization and presents black girls behind white symbols of beauty. She consciously uses epigraph on an excerpt from a white school prima, which was extensively used in the United States. Epigraph suggests the gradation from happy orderliness to disturbing chaos. There are three versions of the same epigraph in the beginning of the text. The first version suggests an ideal white family, which is complete with a beautiful home with a mother, a father, a brother, a daughter, and a friend with love to spare for the cat and the dog. The second version printed without capitalization and without punctuation is a copy of the first. It makes some sense in retrospect and suggests the worldview of aspiring lighter complexioned Geraldine and Maureen Pearls. 
the third version without capitalization or punctuation or spaces between the words stand for the overcrowded and chaotic world of the poor blacks. This version anticipates disorder, moral chaos of breed love, especially Charlie's rape of his daughter Pecola. Instead of giving headline to each chapter, she uses run together versions and snippets from omniscient narration. The entire story is viewed and told from a female point of view. She conveniently uses omniscient narrator as a gap filler who fills the gap in Claudia's narration. She begins the plot at the end of the story and tries to find out how things happened, ignoring why they happened so. Interestingly enough, cyclic nature of narrative and season headings presents the irony. It shifts the conventional understanding of planting to harvest to replanting, that is, birth, death, and rebirth. She subverts it into pathos, tragedy, and madness. In last part, that is the summer section, voices converge through the voice of Claudia and she speaks as a spokesperson for the whole black community. In terms of the style of writing, she uses dense, lyrical, compact language and ends with somber note of tragedy. On the whole, the novel is presented like a quest novel. Now let's focus on the narrators and their voices in the novel. As we have understood, there are primarily two narrators in the novel. Claudia, the first narrator, speaks as an adult about what she has seen in her childhood. She presents things from her vivid memory of the past. Claudia, in reality, more shows than telling. For instance, when she recalls her mother's love, when she talks about Rimo Henry, when she talks about Pecola's menstruation, we can see how she shows more than narrating the incidents. Claudia does not give a systematic account of Pecola's life in a cause and effect manner. Instead, she tells the story in an elliptic, fragmented style, focusing on key episodes. On the other hand, omniscient narrator's narration varies in number. In autumn, there are two sections in which omniscient narrator tells the story. In the first, the narrator describes Breedlove's household, and in the second, she describes Breedlove's family. In winter, narrator explains how Pecola was humiliated at the hands of Junior and Geraldine. The omniscient narrator comes three times in the spring. In all the three sections, Omniscient narrator gives background information of different people, background information about Pecola's mother Pauline, Pecola's father Charlie, and Sop Head Church. In summer, there is a variation on the pattern of alteration. Claudia speaks for everybody, and she uses the pronoun we to represent the black community as whole. Well. Apart from these two primary narrators, there are are the voices as well. Firstly, Pecola's prayers for the blue eyes while she sees her parents quarreling and fighting. Secondly, voices of Pauline in third person account about her relationship with Charlie. Thirdly, Pauline's account is often punctuated with her first person snatches of her memory. Before winding up this unit, Let's find out some of the themes of the novel. The major themes in the novel are sex, love, innocence, race, beauty, and appearance. The love among the blacks in the bluest eye could be defined either by its absence or distortion. Its absence or distortion could be traced to the unattainable ideals of beauty that are broadcast in thousand different ways in white America. This absence of love ultimately fill unresisting black with self-disgust and it cripples them emotionally and psychologically. The novel can be seen as a mediation on the nature of desire itself, directed as it always is 
to a goal that can never be achieved. Another source of distortion is the humiliation suffered by the blacks at the hands of whites. Passion is seen as coming in the way of aspiring black women who wish to deny their origins and be as much like as white as possible. Healthy sexuality is only a distant memory in the entire text. Most characters in the novel are typical. Therefore, what happens to them applies to a large number of blacks. There are moral ambiguities presented in the novel. Toni Morrison avoids the moral absolutism of good and bad. Instead, she works out the gray areas in between. Charlie is an example of a character who is neither wholly good or bad, whose intentions go awry, whose gestures of love takes the form of a rape of his daughter. China, Poland, Miss Mary, the three prostitutes in the novel are the other examples of morally ambiguous characters. By presenting these characters, she refers to commercial sex and considers the prostitutes sympathetically. Henry Washington, who tries to touch Frida's breast, and Soap Head Church, who finally pushed Pecola into insanity by deluding her with blue eyes, are also other representation of morally ambiguous characters. Let's make a recap now. Today we talked about life and works of Toni Morrison, a brief summary of the novel, background and genesis of the novel, narratological analysis of the text, and thematic analysis of the text. For further references, you can refer to the following sources. Once again, this is your host, Muhammad Aslam, saying goodbye, happy reading.